Hello, Sergeant Slater. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Counselor, and thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. <laughs> We're happy to have you. Good morning, everyone. Good to morning, see you. Heather. AC Davis, thanks for joining. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You're you're super quiet there. I don't think you. It, I don't think that'll be an issue, Brad. But I just want to let you know. Thanks. I'll see what I can do on my end if I need to present anything. We have gotten to that point with Zoom complacency where it is three minutes of and most of us aren't here. <laughs> Hello, Brian, Chief White. Brian, is that any better on my end? It is. Okay, yeah. thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining. Absolutely. I was just sarcastically commenting about Zoom complacency uh, amongst my colleagues with three minutes to go. And yeah, I remember when we were starting this, you know, we're all on there at quarter of and yeah. Zoom exhaustion. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, my, my last meeting with the committee, uh, I, I had it wrong on my calendar. I was running across town and showed up a few minutes late because I couldn't get the Zoom on my phone to work. Yeah, mm. I've yet to try the try it on my phone, which maybe that's been a blessing that I've avoided. I it, it scares me. <laughs> <laughs> there have been times where it's definitely convenient, but like overarchingly, I yeah, I think you just need to sit down and enjoy the Zoom as best as one can. Yeah. Yeah. Morning, Teresa. Good morning. So were you actually in Bozeman or Zooming to Bozeman? I was in Bozeman. Nice. Yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. And Megan, are you out there? Can you hear me? I am. Good morning. Good morning. Feel free to get up our uh, public participation attendance slides if you can. Perfect. Thanks. And are you ready to go, Megan, on your end when, when it's nine? I am, yes, thanks for checking. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, I am going to get us going. It's nine o'clock. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna call Committee of the Whole uh, to order for today, May 26th. Uh, we continue to meet virtually. Um, the slide up on the screen is our link to where you can find on the city's websites, agendas and related documents. Um, go ahead, yep, thanks. And this is our public participation um, instructions. If you're a uh, attendee to the webinar, you can raise or lower your hand as a participant. Um, you can also click more if you're on an iPhone or Android phone. Uh, if you're dialing in on a lad line, star nine, will raise and lower your hand. And as always, we've got our city council voicemail at 5526012 and council email council at ci.missoula.mt.us and both of those go to all council members. Um, 
our first item today is roll. Would you be able to call that, Megan? Absolutely. And, and I can tell you, I do know that um, uh, Jesse is traveling and um, Amber uh, might be joining us late, but won't be here at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Okay, Anderson? Becerra? Present. Contos? Harp? Present. Hess? Jones? Merritt? Present. Vasika? Present. Von Lossberg? Here. West? Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think, <clears throat> I know we have some folks that will be joining uh, probably shortly. I think Gwen, for instance, is in an appeals board hearing. Um, so I'm going to hold off on minutes for the moment. Uh, Want to go to um, public comment on non-agenda items. I see one attendee in the audience with their hand up. Mr. Larson, you should be. Yeah, ready. Matt Larson, Ward 3, thank you. Um, your link on your agenda is this is the second week I've, I've addressed this with you guys. It, it's not a link. You know, your committee schedule that you send out, it says link to participate. It's not a link at all. So if you could please adjust that and make it a link or actually make it a web address so that people could actually participate in these meetings, it would be very helpful in getting more public comment other than just me. Um, I had a, um, I, I observed a response from the uh, crisis intervention team last week um, at Butterfly Herbs. Um, a friend of mine that I know decently well was going through an issue with and had the cops called on him by his parents. And his parents actually called the mental health crisis team initially, but the police, the MPD showed up and MPD proceeded to follow this man down the street. One of the new officers, Officer Gway, was in his cruiser with his lights on following this guy down the street before the mental health crisis team arrived. Um, I also followed and around Big A Pizza, um, I, I saw my friend turn around and he didn't want to talk to his parents. He didn't want to talk to the cops. He didn't talk, want to talk to the mental health crisis team, but he wanted to talk to me and I walked him around um, and then took him back to uh, Butterfly Herbs where the police again tried to aggress the situation by walking um, in a line, four of them down the alley, none of them with their body cameras on and uh, tried to uh, essentially I intervened, introduced myself by name. Um, I had to ask them twice what their names were before any of MPD was willing to identify themselves. Um, I believe the shift commander, his first name is Mike. Um, I don't, I don't recall the other three or the other two officers who showed up. I think there were a total of three that showed up the second time. Um, and so I, I just want to know, what you guys can do because apparently Mike says that the MPD officials said that they can't allow the CIT team to respond first because of money issues. So I figured since you guys are doing the budget right now, you could figure out how to maybe shift some of that $18.4 million MPD gets into the little drop of water in a bucket known as the CIT fund um, and maybe allow the CIT team to do their best work and respond first as, as opposed to uh, being a de facto cleanup team uh, or cleanup crew for MPD. Um, MPD needs some more training on just like basic logic with these things. You know, if, you're have a, if you have a mental health crisis situation, your officers do not need to be following someone who has no, hasn't committed any violent acts and has no weapons. They don't need to be following them with the lights on. Like the, 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 yeah, the police lights. Um, so yeah, nice just, just a little bit of a critique. Um, so no further public comment. We will move to our regular agenda. Um, I'm really glad and honored today to, um, to have this update, uh, CIT update. And I want to just by way of introduction, um, read 
bear with me one one computer screen here. Um, the background part of the referral to give some context uh, uh, for folks in the audience and who may watch the video. Um, and this is in the referral in the background section. In July 2020, the city of Missoula entered a contract with Missoula County to use grant funds from the Addictive and Mental Disorders Division at the Montana Department of Health and Human Services to hire a full-time crisis intervention team program manager. Uh, that is Teresa Williams uh, on with us today. The grant is administered by the county's grants and and community programs division. Teresa Williams, a former coordinator of Reaching Home, was hired in November of 2020 to fulfill the role of the CIT program manager, and she is housed under the Missoula Fire Department. Teresa, along with Sar Sergeant Ben Slater from the Missoula Police Department, will present the update today. And I want to um, just quickly say I first met Teresa I believe at the detention center. Um, I still have notes from that very first meeting uh, with her. Um, have been really grateful to work with her uh, when she was uh, in the reaching home position and now in the CIT position. And I want to thank her. Um, I want to thank uh, Sergeant Ben Slater and also Assistant Chief Davis from FIRE where this is housed and Chief White from PD uh, for being here today. And with that, uh, Teresa, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. And before I share my screen, I am incredibly honored to be here today to present to members of the City Council Committee of the Whole, as well as our public. And um, thank you for the introduction, um, President von Losberg. And I am here today with Sergeant uh, Ben Slater, who we have worked together since 2015 when I was working at the Missoula County Detention Facility as a mental health provider. And that's when I was initially recruited um, as a CIT coordinator, and we'll speak more to that. And I'm grateful that Chief Jason White is here today from Missoula Police Department. He is a co-chair of our newly formed CIT Leadership Roundtable that meets quarterly. I'm also um, joined here today by Assistant Fire Chief Brad Davis. I'm grateful um, that he is willing to take on this opportunity of having CIT hosted within his agency, but understanding that this is a, um, a community issue that we're trying to work toward and, and solve together. Joining um, Assistant Fire Chief Brad Davis, um, they're not on camera right now, but hopefully they'll turn on their camera um, throughout the presentation, is um, former firefighter and EMT, and now the mobile support team operations manager and a newly recruited CIT coordinator. His name is John Petroff. He is also on this presentation. And then we also have Ms. Susie Boylan from Missoula County. Um, she is a, uh, an attorney and I put together a slide regarding some stats and, and I'm grateful that she is here and can present on those stats as well. So thank you everyone. And we're hoping that we'll provide this presentation and then there'll be opportunities for questions at the end. Again, that's why I also have other folks here today, um, especially if there are questions around the mobile support team and making that connection how CIT and the mobile support team and other partnering agencies, um, including community members can all work together. So give me one moment while I get my screen ready. Okay, can I get a thumbs up if you can see? Perfect. I'm gonna hide my screen so I can't see you guys. Okay, so crisis intervention team. Um, I'm emphasizing the T as in team because often it gets confused with training. Training is a component of CIT, uh, but it is not the overall solution to this. Training is not going to be the single solution to um, improving how we respond to people in mental health crisis. Um, I want to highlight this picture here from our recent CIT Academy. This does um, emphasize the number of people that it takes to put on a training and not everyone is pictured here. Um, and also the backbone of the CIT program are the coordinators that are volunteered from, from the agencies in our community. Um, I'll speak more to that throughout the presentation, but wanted to highlight um, here we have Tom Hodgetts. He's a mental health professional from St. Patrick Hospital. This is Officer Joe Berger. He is from Missoula Police Department. This is Elise Watts. She is a um, recent MSW grad student and the former program manager of the Pavarello Center. Um, myself, and then we've got John Petroff, who I introduced um, moments ago. 
Um, this is our, our mental health ombudsman, Dennis Nyland. He's over in Helena and he's a CIT coordinator um, for Lewis and Clark County. This is Sergeant Brad Hickok. He's a CIT coordinator um, and it's his full-time role in Gallatin County. And this is Lieutenant Alex Hall. She is over at Missoula County Detention Facility. And here is Ben Slater. Um, in our, and we'll talk more about our academy from this year. We did have two coordinators go through the academy this year, so they're not pictured here. Um, but this just demonstrates that CIT is a, um, it's a statewide program. It's not just local to Missoula. And it takes all of us working together at the local level, at the community level, at the state level to really work on improving how we respond to people in a mental health crisis. So just a quick overview, CIT program is an evidence-based program. We ascribe to um, CIT International. They have a best practices manual. And so it really provides that foundation to promote community and statewide solutions. Um, it also reduces stigma and I'll get to that momentarily. And again, it's the goal is to deflect people from entering the criminal justice system um, who would be better served in another um, in another situation to treat any mental health conditions. Um, in CIT, we're coming together as, as a team and we're working to problem solve um, folks that are going through that system. We're working, we're working to figure out how do we divert people. And we're also working if there are any situations where we could improve as providers between our agencies, whether that's law enforcement to the hospital, mobile support team to the hospital, um, partners um, that are providing mental health services. We all know that there are things that we can do to be better as first responders, as community members, as neighbors. Um, and so that's really what the CIT is, is working, um, working to do. I will turn it over to Ben for some history of CIT. Thank you, Teresa. <clears throat> so part of how we ended up uh, with CIT goes back to uh, the beginning days when uh, President Kennedy made a big push for deinstitutionalization. Uh, and that was intended to be able to shut down a lot of these federally funded uh, mental health institutions. Um, and unfortunately that that dream moved forward in steps, but did not move forward in its entirety. And those uh, federal systems were certainly shut down, um, but the community oriented uh, mental health centers weren't able to fully step forward or be funded at least from the federal level. Um, back in Memphis, uh, back in the late 1980s, there was a terrible incident that occurred where uh, there was a deadly shooting encounter by the Memphis Police Department involving a gentleman of color uh, who was suffering a significant mental illness at the time. Um, the city was already on a verge of unrest and this caused everything to blow up. Uh, at that time, the mayor got together with the uh, police department as well as other community members and said, this is a problem. You guys need to come together and fix this. Um, from that, uh, Lieutenant Cochran of the Memphis Police Department as well as other community members sat down at the table and they developed crisis intervention team. Um, one of those core backgrounds of CIT involves the Crisis Intervention Team Basic Academy, which is a, a 40 hour program that talks about uh, de-escalation, um, stigma, and identifying mental illness and identifying community resources. Um, CIT Montana was created back in about 2007 and it was kind of had a different bunch of different forms throughout the state. Uh, where each uh, community kind of had set up their own piece. Um, at that point, it was sort of fundamentally flawed. Uh, it was taught more as an education only and not as a community partnership um, piece. Um, back in 2016-ish, CIT Montana was created and that helped unify the state as a whole. And what we identified was at least on an education point, we're all working underneath the same rules, the same um, law. Um, there are some consistent mental health partners throughout the state that we were able to partner up with. 
Uh, and we created a framework for how does crisis intervention work well in the state of Montana. Uh, we then pushed that out, unified all communities underneath this central uh, CIT Montana flag and move forward. As Teresa said, uh, both she and I attended a orientation or a coordinator training, for lack of a better term, in Gallatin County in 2015 and pushed out our first academy, I believe it was uh, the spring of 2016. Thank you, Ben. So now I just want to set the scene here, set some foundation. Um, one in five Americans will experience a diagnosable mental disorder in any given year. So think about the number of people that are um, part of this committee right now. Think about the people that are tuning in and, and watching. Um, I think about myself, my own family members, one in five. That is pre-pandemic stats. We're not talking about the, the levels of stress, the loss every, every, that everyone went through in this last year. So think about how do you want yourself or a family member to be cared for? How do you want yourself or a family member treated in a crisis? There is so little money and so little support for mental health services. At the end, we'll talk about um, what I had all the committee members participate in pr prior to this presentation around recovery. Um, so I do wanna highlight, and anyone that's watching, recovery is possible. It is a journey. It does look different for every single person. Um, but one of the biggest barriers to people getting help and accessing help is stigma. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and that's why I am bringing it to everyone's attention today in this presentation, because it's so important. It's not just for those folks that are on duty, off duty. Um, we all have to take care of ourselves and our neighbors. I've also been teaching mental health first aid. It was something that I was trained in in February and I've been um, specifically providing it to um, people in the public safety sector. And I will also be teaching fire and EMS. And um, so far I've done three trainings and the detention officers have been the audience. And when I asked them, what are the top three most prevalent mental illnesses? They always guess schizophrenia. It's not schizophrenia. Schizophrenia in the nation is less than 1% of the population. But when it comes to incarceration and, and our detention officers, that is where people end up. And when I've done trainings at the detention center, I first ask, and these are new officers, um, you know, why did you get into this field? And they'll give me a wide variety of answers. And I said, no one listed that you wanted to work in the new mental health asylum. So I'm gonna give you some more stats here and what we're up against and also provide hope and that we can get out of this, we can work together towards solutions. And so when I am talking about mental illness, I am talking about how it impacts our ability to live, our ability to love, our ability to laugh and our ability to learn. So really think about that. So often we hear a lot about um, myths, again, contributing to stigma, contributing to the unknown, and, and also how media and movies portray people living with a mental illness. Um, so we hear people with mental illness are violent. That is actually a myth. The vast majority of people with mental illness are no more likely to be violent than anyone else. In fact, people with mental illnesses are more likely to be victims of violent crime than the general population. Recovery from a mental illness is impossible. So you've heard me say that it is not impossible. It is, it is a journey, it's gonna look different, but re recovery is possible. And research shows that people with mental illness can get better and many do recover completely. Another myth out there which, which also um, inhibits people from getting help, especially um, in the law enforcement community, in the fire community, first responder community, um, even my own family, is that mental illness is caused by personal weakness. It's absolutely a myth. Um, mental illness is caused by a number of factors, including biological factors, stressful or traumatic life events, and long-lasting health conditions, such as heart disease or cancer. 
and I want to give credit, I literally took this from the CDC um, and I just copy and pasted it in here. There's um, more questions if you want to test your knowledge about mental health, um, but I really encourage all of you to, um, to think about these things. Um, so I mentioned the new asylum and my time in the, the detention facility. Um, in 2015, we, um, and I say we, cause I was at the jail at that time, we instituted what's called the brief jail mental health screen. So when someone comes into the detention facility at booking, they are asked a number of questions um, to, to really understand how do we triage? How do we, how do we get a referral to the mental health department? So I really want to lay this, the, the scene here. Um, some of the questions being asked are, do you currently believe that someone can control your mind by putting thoughts into your head or taking thoughts out of your head? Do you currently feel that other people know your thoughts and can read your mind? Are you currently taking any medication prescribed for you by a physician for any emotional or mental health problems? And there are several more questions and um, there's a, a way to determine on when someone would be referred to the mental health department. So out of those responses and all the numbers of, of brief jail mental health screens that were being completed, this kind of, and so 2021 right here, this is up until May of last week. Um, so already it's pretty high. Um, and then this gives you a comparison of um, 2015 to 2020 and showing that anywhere between 20 to 40% of the people coming in to the Missoula County Detention Facility are having some sort of mental health um, problem and um, to the extreme level that they definitely need to be referred to mental health. And again, thinking back to the audience I've had for mental health first aid, they think the highest mental health disorder out there is schizophrenia. Um, I forgot to mention, it's actually depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. Um, I'm gonna show you another slide here too around um, in 2018 on that brief gel mental health screen, we added homelessness questions. Um, that was around the time when I was implementing the coordinate entry system with community partners. And we wanted to find a way to ensure that folks going into the detention facility, they weren't falling through the cracks of the system. And so if they got referred to the mental health department, then they could um, get them in the coordinate entry system before they're released and help increase their chances um, for getting linked to housing and supportive services. But before I show you that slide, um, the Missoula County Detention Facility um, provided me some additional data and um, Last year, in 2020, they transported nine inmates to Warm Springs State Hospital, so that's our Montana State Hospital. Already from January to last week, they've already transported nine inmates to the Warm Springs State Hospital. Um, Susie, if she's still on this call and, and hasn't been called away to court, um, will tell you a little bit more about uh, mental health commitments. And there is an extreme threshold that one has to meet in order to be involuntary committed. So this really demonstrates how um, sick people are that are going into our jail. And I'm not saying sick in a, in a way of, you know, adding to the stigma. I'm just saying like, these are folks that need our support, need our care, need a better alternative. So these are the, st the stats on from that brief jail mental health screen around homelessness. Um, the question that's being asked is where do you sleep? Where did you sleep most recently? And um, there are other housing options on there, but these ones trigger a referral to the mental health department. So homeless shelter, hotel, motel paid for by program, outside camping vehicle or transitional housing. So these are the HUD homeless definitions. And so um, a lot of the programs we have in Missoula, you have to fit the HUD homeless definition. Um, and that is um, the criteria for the coordinate entry system for homelessness housing. And so that's why we added these questions. And so this just shows you that 20 to 30% in the last few years of folks that are coming through are getting referred. And so, and they have a history. They were most recently in a homeless situation. Okay, Susie, are you still on the line? I am. Perfect. So <laughs> Susie sent me an email with stats. She has not seen this slide yet. And so um, Susie, I took this directly from your slide and highlighted some things. So I hope this will give you a good framework of which to report out. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone for having me. Um, I'll try to be brief in case there are questions. Um, I handle the all of the involuntary mental health commitments for Missoula County the Attorney's Office for a little over 22 years, and I've been handling this caseload um, for a little over three. And I took this caseload over about 10 minutes after all of the case managers were laid off um, with budget cuts. So. Um, that year, our, the number of petitions that we filed went up 25%, and that was 2018. So in 2018, we filed 300 petitions. Oh, I lost my slide, Teresa. Um, we had- I was trying to turn off my email noise. Hang on one second, I'm so sorry. We, um, we had 200 and sorry, we had 300 in 2018. Um, we had 270 in 2019 and we had 284 in 2020. And that was a real surprise because I thought our numbers would skyrocket during the pandemic. Um, I think that the opposite is true. I think our numbers did not skyrocket because so many people weren't being seen and didn't have access to services. And I expect that if we are going to have a big jump in petitions, it will start probably start this summer. Um, what we did see during the pandemic is that the people that we were filing on were so much sicker than we were used to because we did have a skyrocketing number of people who um, went to contested hearings often because they were not even competent to agree to further treatment um, if they wanted to. And um, so we, and we ended up sending, actually committing far more people to the state hospital um, than usual. And so to file, uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, these, these numbers without context don't mean a whole lot, but I mean, it is essentially a full-time job in the Missoula County Attorney's Office to handle the, um, the involuntary commitments. And in order to file a petition on someone, they have to be considered an imminent risk to self an imminent risk to others or substantially unable to meet their basic needs. So the threshold is pretty high. And when, um, when Teresa talks about us pulling nine inmates out of the jail, um, uh, the people get their, their basic needs met generally at the jail, food, clothing, shelter, health, and safety. And a lot of the people that we file on and pull out of the jail we file on because they can't meet their basic needs. They are that they are that ill. They can't even have their basic needs met um, in a structured environment like the jail. Um, and in order for someone to not be able to meet their basic needs, for example, the five basic needs are food, clothing, shelter, health, and safety. Um, homelessness is not enough to file. It has to be some, it, it's about problem solving. And so if someone is so ill, their symptoms are literally interfering with their ability to figure out how to obtain um, adequate shelter, whether it's um, going to the POV or making sure they have a warm enough sleeping bag to sleep outside. Um, if they can't do those things, then they, um, then they can't meet their basic needs. Um, if they think food is poison, so they're not eating, they can't be, meet their basic needs. Um, if they're walking into traffic because they think they can't die, they can't meet their basic need of safety. Um, and the risk to self and risk to others criteria, um, that risk has to be imminent. And by imminent, it means likely to happen at any time. Um, as defined by the Montana Supreme Court. And so what that means is we actually frequently are looking at um, evaluations for people where we sort of think we know what's probably going to happen and that's not enough. I mean, it has to be really, really imminent or it, it has to be because someone has done something very recently like a suicide attempt or you know, articulating a plan or making a threat to someone or assaulting someone. Um, so when we say we do to file 284 petitions in a year, I mean, what I see is a tiny, tiny slice of the mentally ill population in Missoula. Um, my lane is very, very narrow. Um, I see the, the people who are extremely ill, who are refusing to take their medications, who um, are resistant to treatment. 
And um, Teresa has up there that most of the referrals that come to me um, come through the St. Patrick Hospital ER. Um, I I don't want to I, I I don't want to speculate too much, but I do remember hearing that um, I only see about ten percent of the people that they evaluate at the hospital. <clears throat> Please don't quote me on that number, but my point is that they evaluate tons and tons and tons of people who are mentally ill who do not meet the criteria for commitment. So again, my lane is is quite um, my lane is quite narrow. Um, we are very lucky in Missoula, however, because we have wonderful community partners. Um, we when we detain someone pending a, a petition and a potential commitment, um, we are fortunate enough to be able to detain a lot of folks locally. Um, at Dakota Place, which is a Western Montana Mental Health Center crisis house, and at the at NBMI, the Neurobehavioral Medical Inpatient Unit at the Providence Center, they are all wonderful partners, and um, and they what we have to do on a commitment, both when we detain someone initially and when we decide um, what the outcome needs to be, uh, we are legally required to try to place someone in the least restrictive alternative available. Um, and we are very lucky that we have less restrictive alternatives than the state hospital available in Missoula. <clears throat> Pardon me, a lot of counties don't. Um, and so when we, when we file these petitions, we detain them. We hopefully have detained someone locally. We then file the petition and then we have to have a contested hearing within five days. These cases move really fast. It is all about acute stabilization as opposed to long-term stabilization. Um, and so on the day of the hearing, we do another mental health evaluation. That evaluator um, makes a recommendation and it can be one of four outcomes. Um, one is dismissal if the person no longer meets criteria, the legal criteria for commitment and does not mean they're well. It just sometimes it means that they're just under meeting that legal threshold, but I still have to dismiss. Um, it could be commitment to the Montana State Hospital with or without um, authorization for administration of involuntary medications. It could be what's called a community commitment, which is um, essentially a court order for local treatment or what we call a, the, the fourth outcome is a diversion where the person is close enough to stabilizing that they can that they can stay where they are or stay in one of our move to one of our local facilities because we think that they will clear up enough or the, the treatment providers think that they will clear up enough to um, stabilize within 14 days, which then allows us to dismiss the petition. So that's kind of a really, really short summary um, about where we are, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Teresa, would you mind if I uh, ask one question? Sure. Um, and I apologize to my colleagues. I'm going to break protocol, ask one, and then I'm going to ask folks to hold their questions. Susie, first off, thanks for taking the time to join us. Sure. Um, you mentioned the state budget cuts in 2018 that resulted in the case managers uh, being laid off. And that's something that I and several of my colleagues uh, were very familiar with and, and the results of that uh, practically in the community. And then there was quite a bit of talk about the, the restoration of those cuts. And I'm wondering if you could just clarify for everybody, you know, one thing is, um, case managers and the work they do are not light switches that turn on and off. Uh, and I honestly don't know exactly where we back are, where we are relative to uh, where we stood with those cuts. And maybe you could speak to that briefly. You know, um, there are, there are certainly more case management positions than there were um, when I started. Um, the difference between when I started and, you know, a year ago or so is pretty significant, but um, there's, I don't think there were enough to begin with. Um, I think case management is so critical. I mean, that the, the thing that was so devastating about those budget cuts is that case managers were supposed to be the backstop. That position was invented, as far as I am aware, to keep people out of the state hospitals. And so losing those positions just, I think, shifted a lot of expense to counties and to other parts of the system. Um, so there are, there certainly are more case managers, um, but there are 
we deal with so many people who really need intensive case management and there are not a lot of those types of case managers. Um, we did uh, last year, uh, we invented a case management position to work with the commitment cases. Um, Eli Parker, who's my counterpart at the um, Office of the Public Defender, we, we essentially got a grant funded position for our cases because we have so many people who are still quite ill that we have to dismiss on. And we sort of send them out saying, good luck finding your sleeping bag and making that appointment in three weeks and picking up the prescription that you can't afford. Um, and sometimes are too sick to figure out how to get to. Um, and so we now have a, a case manager who works with us. And I, I, I can't quantify this in any kind of expert kind of way, but I am firmly convinced that the reason we only had 284 petitions last year was because of her. Um, and one of the things she focused on pretty significantly was housing. And so I think that um, if there's anything that we need more of besides, I mean, we need more local beds, but um, we need more case managers and intensive case managers. Thank, thanks very much. And sure. Teresa, back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. And if you need to leave, totally understand. You're very busy. I, Thank you. I'm okay till 10. Okay, perfect. So next, I really want to lay the foundation around the goals of a crisis intervention team. It's paramount that we're increasing safety and we're increasing the safety of, of the officer, the responder, the community, as well as the person in crisis. So that is paramount here. Oftentimes law enforcement and first responders are the first to interact with someone um, that is experiencing a mental health crisis, whether it's their first break with psychosis, um, they're not sure what's going on, it's family members are calling 911. And at that time, CIT trained officers know that they have a real opportunity here to help people um, treat and early intervene to someone's mental health crisis. And so we really want to increase those connections. And we spend a lot of time teaching um, law enforcement and first responders the resources available in the community. We also want to make sure that we're using law enforcement strategically um, and we're increasing those community supports. Um, so we want to use them for criminal concerns or an imminent threat to safety. So there are times when um, when if, if there is a weapon and, and um, or if, if it's going to rise to that level where um, people do need to be brought into protective custody, it is state law that law enforcement does that transport. Um, we really want to increase those community supports. Um, and, um, you know, that's another area where we have mobile support team, which is a component of an effective crisis response system. And I'll show you a slide about that later. And another critical piece of this is improving client outcomes. In all of our interactions, we want to reduce trauma for the person in crisis, and we want to promote that long-term recovery. And that's why I want to keep saying recovery is possible. Um, and we really want to ensure, again, that we're improving those client outcomes. And Ben is going to tell us about the core elements of CIT. Thank you, Teresa. And I'm going to start kind of blowing through a couple of these slides, being mindful of time. Um, so I would believe that everyone who is on the meeting will have an opportunity to be able to read these slides. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of uh, our ongoing operational and sustaining elements. Ongoing elements here continue to be building out our community partnerships, um, as well as uh, what parts here um, within our partnerships go to evolve our policies and procedures. How can we continue to do this job better? And what can we take as lessons learned, not just in our community, but nationally and internationally? Our operational elements, those groups that are actually out and working the system, include that frontline officer, the, the responder, the, the firefighter, the paramedic, um, any person who has that direct one-on-one -on -one contact with an individual uh, who is exhibiting a signs of a mental health crisis. Um, Back-end stuff is our curriculum. Again, how do we evolve our program? How do we modernize? And how do we uh, take developing legislative issues uh, and be able to continue to move forward? Um, the mental health receiving facility, again, uh, where can we take someone that is not jail? Uh, to be able to uh, help them move forward or towards a point of recovery. 
And then the sustaining elements uh, is, again, back-end stuff, uh, evaluation and research, our continuing ed, as well as recognition for those, those frontline CIT officers, those back-end CIT coordinators that are doing exceptional. How do we recognize them for the work that they're doing? As well as events like this, public outreach. How do we tell people within the community about what our uh, crisis intervention team is doing to be able to uh, move forward in our community? Thanks, Ben. And in my quarterly updates, I do speak to um, how we keep working toward these um, 10 core elements for a CIT program. We did touch on the CIT coordinators in the very beginning. Here's the full list of all of our CIT coordinators uh, um, in our, as part of our crisis intervention team. Um, each year we do go to CIT International and Montana is really well represented. Um, this one, I think, was in Seattle um, two years ago. Last year, it was virtual. Uh, so we've got our members here. And again, we all support each other. I travel to other communities, as does Ben and other coordinators. So we stay fresh on, our, on the curriculum um, and vice versa. And they, they, everyone can see that this, again, is not just a local CIT effort. This is a statewide CIT effort. And Ben's going to tell us about our recent academy. Um, so as it notes here, uh, our recent academy had a few less participants than we would normally like to run. Uh, Missoula and Gallatin County generally run two of the largest CIT academies in the state, uh, mostly by region, uh, because we have a lot of individuals who this is uh, the best community for resources or our community is where they seek resources. For example, uh, Ravalli County and Missoula County share a lot of resources together, as well as uh, mineral and granite um, share our resources as well. Uh, this year, we uh, hosted about 33 participants of those. Uh, I'm gonna go with roughly round numbers here, but roughly a quarter were sworn law enforcement, a quarter were through fire EMT. And I believe that caught at least the EMTs from the mobile support team. Um, about a quarter were mental health uh, individuals. And then the remaining quarter made up uh, probation and detention. Thank you, Ben. Um, this just gives you an idea of the number of topics that are covered in that 40 hour academy. Students are provided um, with a link to our learning management software. And so they go through a bunch of PowerPoints and quizzes prior to even coming to the class. So when they are in class, we have um, speakers that come in and we tell them, you, you know, we need you to come in and you need to commit to being a resource as well. Um, so that is kind of the caveat for our speakers and we avoid you know, just presentations. We wanna make sure it's really interactive that our participants can ask questions. We have a lot of panels. Um, a lot of people with lived experience come in. Um, we do, we um, brought in all nations to give a native community cultural consideration presentation. Um, Andy Nelson from the LGBTQ Center came in and talked about considerations for, um, for folks um, from that community. So we, we really, bring so much in in that 40 hours. And then in all of that, our participants are practicing all the skills um, and putting it into action. So it becomes ingrained in muscle memory um, for when they're having interactions. This year, we were not able to go to the state hospital. Um, every other year, we, we take a road trip, we go to the state hospital, we visit patients at the state hospital. Um, they did do a modified um, presentation for us via Zoom. And, um, but again, just really show you so much. And we also do a site visit to Western Montana Health Center so folks can see the crisis stabilization and also hear more um, from people and their lived experiences, um, whether positive or negative with law enforcement and first responders. Um, we're gonna kind of go through these pretty briefly as well. Um, ben knows this as well as our participants, but we did a lot of evaluations in our academy this year. Folks were doing them each day. And then I also sent um, an evaluation at the, the very end so we could get a, a good idea of how the training was for participants. Um, some of the takeaways, um, I kind of broke it out into mental health, fire, EMS, and law enforcement. Um, for law enforcement, 
Um, understanding that the way people experience mental health disorders differs from person to person, more patience and slow instructions to people in crisis. Um, for FIRE EMS, they're very new to this CIT community, and so it was great to have them come through the academy. Um, so one um, responder said, the amount of work being done in Missoula by so many different groups and agencies to address some serious issues in our community. So that was a takeaway. Um, here are some pictures from the academy. Um, one of, we also wanted to know what are barriers that you might have in your agency that's going to interfere with implementation of the information learned from our training. And um, time management skills, sometimes work is very busy, bias in my job, stereotypes, learning to know when to spend the time, um, there are preset ideas. Uh, one of the, um, the, the pieces that we teach to our students is an acronym called DBEAT. Um, so distance, um, being really safe, um, having your backup, using empathy, your awareness, but also time. This is gonna take a lot of time on the front end and that's where that constraint piece, if there's another call, um, things like that in every setting. So time is usually one of the, the more challenges for folks. Some more pictures. And then we also have some volunteer takeaways. So Stacy um, was able to volunteer as a role player. Um, we had Juanita Vero volunteer as a role player this year. We also, as part of the continuing education, our former graduates come back and they also volunteer as role players. Um, so really important that um, they are evaluating our students. And again, the criteria is, would you want this officer first responder to come to your home and meet with your family member that's in crisis. So that is literally the grading, um, the grading um, criteria that we're using. Um, so here are some, some comments from our volunteers. As if, if you know me, you know I'm always thinking about solutions and being solution oriented and what can we do um, to really problem solve. And so I did have a, a, you know, a, a poster on the wall where if there were gaps and, and um, solutions that were coming up throughout the week, how do we capture that? Um, so here are some comments from participants throughout the week of the Academy. Um, we need a public information officer to get success stories out to the public. 24 hour CIT, a detox unit can't reach those most in need of mental health care when unsheltered because organizations refuse. Um, a place where people can keep their medication. And that's often what we hear is it's so hard to track and, and um, treat any sort of mental illness if you are unsheltered um, because where do you keep your medication? It's really challenging. So I want to just kind of give you an idea. This is from CIT International. This gives you a framework of an integrated crisis response system. So right now, this is kind of our only default is everything goes through 911 for emergency medical services, for law enforcement. Um, right now, the mobile crisis team is um, dispatched via um, 911 in a co-responder model. Um, and then these are the kind of the outcomes that can happen, either that's the emergency department or um, remaining on scene, and maybe it's a referral to a family member. I ultimately in the future, um, this is coming to Missoula, is a crisis line called 988 that'll be operated um, by Western Montana Mental Health Center. Um, but our hope is then that this is another pathway um, that we can help people in a behavioral health crisis. And so it can go to the mobile crisis team or even go to a warm line. A lot of people in crisis, um, these can be addressed just telephonically with professionals or peers, um, people with lived experience that have, um, are now in recovery and, and can support folks. And then over here is this mental health receiving center that is a core component of an effective CIT program in that um, this is a no wrong door facility. So we don't need to route you through the ER first. This is a place where anyone can go regardless of how they're presenting, regardless if, if there's any substances on board. Ben, I'm, <laughs> I've been going through these fast. So I'm gonna kick it to you to talk about this one. All right, so 
Um, just as some highlights here about our partnership and community ownership. Um, so what is CIT here doing behind the scenes? Obviously our, our basic academy is the big bright shining public, hey, we're out here, as well as uh, Teresa's done a fantastic job about putting us in front of all of you policymakers on a very frequent basis. Um, but what are some other things that we continue to do behind the scene to be able to make this system work? Um, every other Monday, we have a group of, that's what bi-monthly means. I always read, Teresa, bi-monthly means every other month, not twice monthly. So thank you. Um, bi-monthly or every other Monday, we have a group of people who all have their fingers in the mental health system from law enforcement to the Pavarello, to the hospitals, to the mental health centers, to the mobile support team all come together and we talk about some of our individuals who pop up more frequently than others or individuals that we know are falling through the cracks. And with those folks, uh, we try to identify ways that we have an intersect. So it's not just a law enforcement problem. It's not just a mental health problem. We all are having fingers in this person. And so how do we move them um, through the system to have a better success? Um, quarterly, our leadership uh, has a, uh, a meeting again with some policymakers and some oversight just to be able to explain how do we as an organization, how do we as a crisis intervention team need some more help or report back and say, here are our successes. And then with those coordinators within the agencies that help uh, support those members inside of the agency, we meet monthly uh, to be able to discuss some ways that we can, uh, again, make this system better. Uh, like I like to say, as a coordinator within the community, I may not be the officer who is responding to that 911 call or to that emergency call to be able to provide help, but I'm there when stuff goes absolutely wrong. This didn't work as designed. So I bring that back to our coordinators and say, hey, this is broken. So let's put this back together and identify where the disconnect is so that we can move this to uh, work as it was intended or as it's planned. Thank you. And I should mention here too, um, the Strategic Alliance for um, Improved Well-Being, I think I got that right. Um, they meet monthly and we share similar partners. And so they gave us one of their meetings every quarter. Um, so we can bring those stakeholders along with um, additional CIT stakeholders to come together because one of the um, big efforts that the Strategic Alliance is, work, is working on is that No Wrong Door facility, which is a component of CIT, as I keep mentioning, and we want to work together, not in silos, and figure out how do we push this forward, um, because all too often in my role as a CIT coordinator and program manager, I get calls from law enforcement who are just, just morally you know, struggling in that um, they're working with someone um, that's uh, you know, diagnosed with a mental illness, and they literally have no other options. And they're like, Teresa, what can we do? This is, this is hurting me that I don't have any options. I can't even imagine what that's like for the family and for the person that's in crisis. So um, I want to get to your guys's chart here. Um, but before we do that, this is something that I've always integrated into my trainings at the detention facility, and I'm, and I'm bringing it to this audience. But if we treat people as they are, we make them worse. If we treat people as they ought to be, we help them become what they are capable of becoming. And so I'm just gonna quickly just share what you guys put together in terms of um, what recovery means to you. Safety really stands out there, that it is so important that in order to, to be in that recovery place, safety is paramount. Um, health, supportive, wholeness, thriving, happiness. So just showing that recovery looks different to everyone and um, we can get there if we are being innovative, creative, um, working on connections, all of those pieces. Um, so thank you. And I will open it up for questions. I apologize, I only saved five minutes. No, thank you, Teresa. And thank you, Ben and Susie. A um, couple logistics things, uh, Megan, I just wanted to note that uh, all council members are here except the two I mentioned would be gone, um, Jesse and um, and actually Amber is, is, was here. Um, and then uh, I wanted to just briefly comment, uh, make sure the public is aware that 
the agenda, both the PDF agenda and the, the, the uh, HTML agenda, both do have links to get to this meeting. Um, at our meetings too. Uh, one of our counselors had trouble with their email and actually got to the meeting via that link. Uh, so I just wanted to assure people that that was the case. Um, we do have limited time here, but I want to provide a comment to any of my or opportunity for any brief comments from my colleagues. Uh, as Teresa mentioned, Stacy uh, Anderson participated uh, in um, the last academy. So, Stacy, I'll go to you. And I know some people are queuing up. We're going to have to be really brief, folks. Thanks so much. I'll be really quick. I thank you so much, Teresa, for giving me the opportunity to participate. It was. Um, I, I had a very good time and it was incredibly eye-opening to see the various scenarios and all the intention and work that went in to put on this CIT Academy. So my hat's off to you and all the fellow coordinators, um, such an amazing job. And it was really, you know, we as role players knew exactly what the scenario was going to be, who was what, what role you were supposed to play, how you were supposed to react given the, um, you know, prompting from the officers or whoever was um, the first responders in that role play scenario. But it was an excellent reminder that those first responders don't have any idea what they're walking into each time they come to a call. And, um, and having this scenario um, play out and seeing how they handled themselves and you right. It helps with that muscle memory. It helps kind of like bring to real life. Um, and even in this is a very safe environment, they knew none of us had weapons and things like that. But um, it was really just kind of eye opening and just so critical. So I guess my question, if I allow uh, comment quickly, but question is, I would love to know from either either Sergeant Slater or Chief White kind of um, you know, what is the sort of plan to get more officers through the CIT program uh, or the academy and kind of how are you integrating that into your overall um, training and what are the criteria for an officer who wants to participate uh, beforehand? Is it self-selection or whatnot? I think that would be important to know when we get to questions. <laughs> that, let's go ahead and Chief White, do you have any quick response to that? It's also something that uh, I think it's on the minds of all of the council members and it's something we want to be supportive in. So if you have any uh, quick response in that, you're uh, welcome. Quick to response. We currently have 44 officers that have been through the CIT training and three of our civilian personnel that have um, uh, first touch with, with folks. And you know the unfortunate part is based on the academy only running once per year uh, because of the, the, the costs associated with that and the amount of staff time, not only from the police department, but from uh, all of our stakeholders and partners, we are only able to offer those academies once a year. And we maximize the number of officers that we can get in uh, when we are provided that opportunity. So uh, if we can get uh, five or six additional per year in there, we will absolutely support that. Um, trying to build out uh, future capacity, um, working through CIT Montana is uh, critical for us. And, and when we can get people into some of the regional trainings around us, we will also sleep, uh, you know, do our best to get folks in um, when they're in and around us. So it's not a travel burden or anything like that, but it is something that we absolutely support and we'll continue to get our people trained. Thanks, Jake. I just want to add, though, because I know we're running out of time, like training is not the single solution here. It is a huge component, but we can't, where do officers take people when they're in a crisis? And um, their options are so limited. And even family members, where do they take people when their family is in crisis? So we have to think big picture, too. Yeah. I'm going to go to Heather and Heidi. Uh, Amber, I know you, ha you have your hand up. I'm going to close it out after them just from time constraints. Um, go ahead, Heather. Thank you. Um, and to all of you as our first responders of social work in this community, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Teresa, the video that you shared with us um, and had us watch, I just want you to know that is my family's lived experience. So it is very much a real thing that happens. So my question to you all, knowing what we know today and knowing that we all want to improve, 
what kind of resources are do your departments need in order for us to take take things to the next level? Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna, jump in. I'm, gonna I'm gonna actually comment on this from some framing at the end. I'll build off that. But let okay. Heidi, let's get yours on as well. Uh, uh, thank you for this great presentation. I just. Uh, one slide stood out to me a lot about, um, I guess, officers feeling like they don't have enough time um, in their interactions. And I was curious if our new staffing rotation has had, I guess, an impact on how officers feel like they can handle these situations, like, uh, or, if, or, if, or if we're tracking it, because um, we did have a big change in how we staff our police department recently. Perfect, I can answer this one. Um, so Heidi, I'm currently a patrol sergeant. In fact, I fulfill one of our two day sergeant positions. And one of the things that I can tell you with our current staffing is as we have uh, full staff, when full staff is available, then there is much more time to be able to afford to these situations. But as we are still new in that situation, and we do have some embedded trends that have happened for some officers that have been here for like 13 years or better, um, then it does take a minute to be able to uh, kind of not have that anxiety uh, of, I have to finish this call so that I can be available for the next call. Um, it is something that continues to improve. Um, and as uh, the Yes, we continue to hire almost what appears to be a, a small platoon of new officers to be able to backfill some of these vacancies, then that situation continues to improve on the patrol side as well. Thank you. Thanks. So I just, I wanna close this out and I wanna recognize um, there's one hand in public comment. It's already been provided relative to the agenda topic. Um, so I'm gonna close this out for the day and it, it's uh, related to Heather's question. Um, all of these conversations, you know, I approach with a lens toward the resources and budget that we have to allocate. A couple of things that stand out to me from the presentation um, were the, uh, the gaps in solutions from students and some of the things identified there. Uh, Teresa's comments around this isn't just training, but you know, facilities and, and places are an important component here. And then I think all of this also feeds into that slide about crisis stabilization or the, the components of an integrated crisis response system. And it's been my experience on council, you know, last year, I think we took a gigantic step forward in the community with the funding be above and beyond the match requirement for the mobile crisis response unit. But often, and I was just having this conversation with Terry Kendrick yesterday, um, when we, uh, when we put some good resources toward one thing, it tends to be one of the things that is the highest sort of priority and getting attention. And it doesn't solve a whole system as issue. It, it tends to highlight sort of the next thing in line that uh, where we really are seeing a gap uh, to an extent. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, there are several things there, but, but a location for crisis stabilization is been one of the most important sort of uh, opportunities and, and needs that I've seen you know, during my seven and a half years on council. And it's, it's an area I hope that we make some progress, some substantial progress. And I know from a planning standpoint with partners in the community, we are making that progress, but, uh, but at some point, you know, it needs to be realized on the ground. So my, my final comments, and I really appreciate Chief White and AC Davis uh, being on here with us. You know, this material, and I encourage all my colleagues to go through uh, Teresa's reports um, and the associated materials, all of this is provided as a lens through which, you know, we get to budgeting. And I think that was, you know, Heather's point as well. Uh, and I don't want to try and shortchange that conversation during uh, the last minutes uh, over time of a committee meeting, um, because it's really a process that goes on four months in my experience on council. These are discussions amongst ourselves, uh, colleague to colleague, it's discussions between and among us on council with parts of the administration, members of the administration. Um, uh, I talk to Teresa a lot <laughs> and I take uh, uh, what she says and her recommendations uh, very seriously as with um, a lot of the other 
leadership in the administration. So I will leave it at that point, but that's the feedback that Heather was getting at and that I'm getting at that over the coming weeks and months will be, I think, the most critical to us. So um, thank you so much, uh, Teresa, Ben, Susie, uh, and the others that joined us. And we're a little over time. Thank you, Jordan, for a little extra, few extra minutes. And with that, we will be adjourned. <laughs>